the coolest one. All right. So tonight we have our uh, keynote speaker. His name is Dr. Michael Gourlay. Uh, he has most recently worked as the principal lead software development engineer at Microsoft on HoloLens in the Environmental Understanding Group. I think that's a long title. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, everybody give a warm welcome to Dr. Gourlay. get a shot of this. I'll explain it in a second, but you know, you're going to act like I'm getting shocked. <laughs> okay, so that little camera right there, it takes a picture of everything. I'm just going to leave it there. It's a, uh, it's a great complement to augmented and virtual reality because it takes a picture in, in all possible directions. So, all right, so I'm Michael Borlay, and uh, tonight I want to tell you about what I think is the future of augmented and virtual reality. And I'm going to tell you about a new way of thinking about augmented reality platforms, aside from what I think is the obvious way of thinking about them. And I'll close with a prediction about who is going to pioneer that new way of thinking about augmented reality. So first, the, the story I'm going to tell you sort of is a meandering tale with some twists. And those twists will make more sense if you understand more about my story, so I'm going to tell you about that. So I'm shy, and as a shy child, I tended to have uh, at most one close pal at a time, and eventually, uh, you know, that pal and I would part ways because I would change schools or whatever. Uh, and I always wanted to have persistent friends. And when I was a kid in the late 70s and early 80s, my mom would take me to the grocery store, uh, you know, and uh, or you know, she'd go grocery shopping, and she'd either drop me off at the video arcade. Remember, this is the 80s. Or I would hang out at the magazine aisle. And so that was sort of the formative uh, features of my life were video games and reading from magazines. And there was one article in particular that I remember reading, and this is as a little kid and it sticks with me today. And I was reading about this thing called ELIZA, which is an artificial intelligence. And this is written in the 1960s. And so what they counted as artificial intelligence then, you know, the, the, the notion of what counts as artificial intelligence has evolved over time. Eliza is a really simple text processing bot that acts superficially like a psychotherapist. And supposedly some of the people who tried using Eliza found it so compelling that they even revealed personal and intimate details to this bot. And I was reading this article about this and I thought that was really interesting. In fact, uh, the idea of, uh, of interacting with a computer in this personal way and this was a completely foreign concept to me, but that idea instilled in me an obsession that pervaded my life, and it continues even now. I wanted to interact with computers in this personal way, and I wanted them to understand me. And I wanted to create my own power. So uh, I bought an Atari computer, and most kids, when they buy an Atari, would buy games. I bought the programming pack that you could get with it. So back then, you could either buy game packs or programming packs. And it came with this book that was basically Teach Yourself Basic, which is a computer programming language. And that's how I started learning how to program. Uh, and I still have that book today, and it's great because it has like little kid scrawl and pencil um, and you know, uh, answering all the questions that it asked. But uh, after pondering artificial intelligence and toying with the idea, uh, I perhaps naively concluded that in order to understand people, computers had to understand the world that we live in. And to get computers to understand humans, I first needed to get them to understand our environment. I didn't, at the time, have a lot of faith in the way that AI was going, which is a fairly, I mean, I was a teenager, what did I know? And so that's in no way a statement about what researchers are actually doing. It was more about my own hubris. But what I decided to do was to study physics using computers. In other words, I wanted to get computers to understand the environment, and I felt like that was a route to that way of doing things. So for my doctoral study, I chose this computationally involved branch of physics, which is computational fluid dynamics. And it's hiding a little bit behind this Tesla coil, but there are some pictures down there of the kind of stuff that I did. Um, so I learned about physics simulations using numerical algorithms, and I also learned about data visualization using computer graphics. And it turns out, uh, I was a research scientist for a while, and I didn't enjoy certain aspects of academic research. So I left it to pursue another discipline that merges simulation with visualization, 
and that is making video games. So I joined Electronic Arts, and I made video games, including Madden NFL, which is here today. If you guys haven't seen it, it's up on the fourth floor. And at the time I was at uh, EA, I interleaved that time to help start this program at the University of Central Florida called FIA, and they're also representing here today. In fact, there are some people in the audience and people, uh, other people giving panels who are from FIA. FIA is a graduate program that teaches programmers, artists, and designers how to make games and other interactive simulations. So now, I work at Microsoft on HoloLens, which is an augmented reality platform. Most of you are probably familiar with that term, augmented reality, and you probably have a pretty crisp idea in your mind about what augmented reality means to you. What I'm gonna tell you is what it means to me, both today and more, more to the point of this talk, uh, in the future. The most immediately obvious aspect of augmented reality is that it lets you see holograms in the world. Uh, and so let me play this video and, and speak to it. So, so that's a really powerful, uh, but it's a simple illusion, but it's very powerful. So we have this boy standing there in Kyoto. And in order to pull off that illusion requires incredibly sophisticated algorithms, sensors, and computation. Uh, this video is from a colleague of mine who, who worked with me on Mullins. His name is George Klein, and he made this back in 2009. And I believe this was either part of his doctoral research or, you know, shortly thereafter. So I want to talk about certain aspects of this, because these, these are kind of the basics of AR. In order for us to believe in that illusion, there are certain aspects or certain properties that it has to have. First, it has to be locked to the world, which he was. And you'll notice that when I played the video, the camera was kind of moving around, but Cartman seemed like he was attached to the real world. And that world locking is a key feature. Second, in this picture, Cartman occludes the real world. Occludes just means he's hiding the things that are behind him. So we can't see the buildings in the ground that are behind him. So that, that piece of occlusion is key. And there's a third part, which is that he's not falling through the ground, and he's not walking through buildings. So he seems to be obeying physical laws that we're familiar with. Uh, so there's, a, there's another aspect, which I'm not going to show you in this picture, but I'll show you a little bit later, which is that real-world objects should also include him. And I'm going to return to those points uh, in a bit. But uh, there's another aspect of augmented reality besides this visual aspect which is maybe less obvious, which is the question of how do users interact with augmented reality platforms? So a lot of us are already familiar with this notion of computers and humans interacting. And in case you can't read it, in that intersection region, it says computer-human interaction. And that's been a field of study basically since computers have been around. So it's been studied for decades, but I want to add to that. And the thing I want to add to that is the environment. So now I've added one element, and now there are, instead of two circles, there are three circles. But now instead of one overlap region, there are a total of four overlap regions. And some of these we're familiar with already, and some are new. So for example, in the overlap region between humans and environment, there is conventional reality. And that's the place where we like to live. Right? So there's another overlap region between computers and environment, and that is new. And that is a region that I'll call environment understanding. And that, in fact, is the group in Microsoft where I work. It's called the environment understanding group. And when you combine all three of those together, you get augmented reality. So it's the intersection of humans, computers, and the environment. And it has in common that there, there are elements of hum human-computer interaction, conventional reality, and this new thing called environment understanding. So I want to tell you more about environment understanding. Uh, but I, I first I want to familiarize with uh, some of what I mean by this. This is a very abstract diagram, uh, abstract set of concepts, but let me show you some examples of what I mean by this. So this is a fictional one, but in a sense all of augmented reality is fictional, so I think it's legitimate. Uh, and in this scenario, we have an engineer who is designing something, and he's designing that in the situation where it would actually be used, and it's helping him visualize this. So let me show you another example of this. This is 
not fictional in the sense that this didn't wasn't made by this isn't a movie. This is a, well, it is a movie, but it's a movie not meant for entertainment. This is a guy who made his own augmented reality experience, and he's using a Kinect sensor to track his skeleton, and he's rendering on top of that a composited model, which is stuck to his body. So this is another example of augmented reality. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's another uh, piece of this, which is, uh, so what if you want to create an object in the real world? So augmented reality will help you do that. And, and it can help you do that in the space where the piece would end up. So let's watch this video. And notice what the user is doing is they're using this, this sort of paintbrush to create uh, an object and that table that's there, that's their actual table. That's not a virtual table or, or a synthetic table. That's their actual table. The only part of the scene that is virtual is the part inside of the box in, in the ball. The other thing that augmented reality lets us have is an infinite canvas. So we're used to having to buy monitors when we want more monitors or just not having extra space. But with augmented reality, if we want more monitors, if we want more workspace, we just create it, and you can do that with a gesture. So augmented reality eventually gives us, un, uh, sorry, effectively gives us unlimited virtual displays and an unbounded amount of screen real estate. It also lets us visualize things like how furniture would look in our apartment or in our, you know, our personal spaces, and it could also capture the furniture that we have and let, it, let us bring it to a furniture store and see how things uh, uh, would go together. So AR lets us capture and visualize and manipulate things in a, in a virtual way. It also lets us visualize things that are difficult to understand. So I love this example because it has personal meaning to me. These images depict concepts of vector calculus. That's not an approachable subject. In fact, the words vector calculus, that, that's not an, even an approachable pair of words. What do those words even mean? Some people probably haven't even heard those two words before. And first, uh, when I was learning them, I struggled to learn these concepts. And later, when I was teaching, I struggled to teach them. The concepts are very abstract. But visualizing them makes them concrete. Now, maybe from this picture, you haven't already understood what vector calculus is. But trust me, looking at these pictures does help when somebody is giving you sort of the mathematical formula behind them. And if you can give a, a concrete visualization and you can make interactive virtual simulations with them, you can make them fun and interesting. And interest is a key to success in education. I think that one of the key parts of education isn't answering questions, but instilling curiosity and making people ask more questions. Uh, but there is another school of thought that says that these hard-won concepts should remain elite and hard-won. So I'll let you read this panel. So that, that's a cartoon from uh, a, a, a cartoon called Saturday Morning Breakfast Series. Uh, augmented reality also lets users communicate with each other remotely in more compelling and personal ways than ever before using holographic telepresence. And we've seen examples of this over and over in, in movies. And AR would allow things like this. So those were just some examples of augmented reality that weren't just the basics of rendering holograms into the world, but also involves some aspect of interaction, interaction with the environment. Uh, and so I mentioned engineering, art, productivity, design, education, and communication. And I'll give some more examples later. Uh, but next I want to talk about an important concept, which is reality. So I've just showed you examples of augmented reality, but I want to contrast that with another kind of reality. So if you know anything about either augmented reality or virtual reality, you probably think of them as similar. Maybe some of you don't even make the distinction. After all, they both have the term reality in them, and they both have headsets that let you experience them. So what's the difference? Uh, one is augmented and the other is virtual, right? So that's the difference. But what does that mean? There's a more fundamental difference, though, between just the difference between augmented and virtual. And that is the fact that the word reality in those two phrases actually refers to a different thing. 
So not only is augmented not the same as virtual, but the reality in augmented reality is not the same as the reality in virtual reality. What do I mean by that? Well, virtual reality is a completely synthetic alternative to reality. Whereas augmented reality is our reality, this reality, but enhanced in some way. So that might be kind of a subtle idea, but what I'm really saying is that that word reality doesn't actually, it's, it's the same word that it has two different definitions. And if you think about swapping the words augmented and virtual and other phrases, I think you'll start to understand what I mean, that they're talking about two completely different things. Uh, in virtual reality, you're replacing reality with something else, and that something else is more iconic. By iconic, I mean it is a, an abstract representation of the real thing. And just like this progression of pictures at the bottom shows, which is taken from a book called Understanding Comics, um, we go from something that's realistic and distill it down. Now that has power, uh, but it's different. So, so virtual reality requires that you replace the entire world completely. Even if you leave it empty, you have completely created an empty world. It's also the case that when you create a virtual reality experience, you're responsible for creating all the rules that make that reality happen. Now you can try to make them seem like our physical laws, and a lot of games do that, but you are also given the freedom to create impossible scenarios and create physical laws that don't actually exist or are not possible. Uh, also, virtual reality is not constrained by real world content. Uh, not as much, anyway. Uh, but it is the case right now that when you're immersed in a VR experience, the user can't see the real world. That's by design. But it also means that they can't really navigate the space that they're in. So if you were in a cluttered environment with a VR headset, you could hurt yourself if you're not careful. And that's kind of, you know, but so but the point is that when you completely replace the real world, that's both a benefit and a hazard. In contrast, AR builds upon big R reality. So augmented reality, uh, well, so first of all, reality has a lot of pre-existing content. And it would be a shame not to exploit that. It's like the ultimate turbo squid. Uh, but AR platforms encourage the users to explore their environment so they can walk around. And uh, it also means that developers for a AR content are very strongly encouraged, if not required, to exploit that pre-existing content. In other words, they have to incorporate the real world into that AR experience. And uh, for example, they, they need to Oops, they need to lay out a play space. So for example, if I wanted to play a game on the stage, I would somehow have to have a virtual representation of the layout of what's here. And if I wanted to build a platform or like a little character running around and jumping maybe on top of this platform and so on, or maybe down off the stage and down there, then the, the simulation would have to know something about that environment. And this is where it gets interesting. When you're building a VR experience, you generally just build whatever you want. If you want a big flat plane, you have a big flat plane. If you want uh, slopes and platforms, you can just build those. If you're building an AR game, you have to take into account the stuff that's there. And not only do you get to use it, but you have to use it. So you, a lot of the level layout, the design of the game, has to be built into the game itself, rather than being pre-built uh, before the game is shipped. So that's, that's really cool. It can be daunting, but it's also really amazing. <coughs> Um, so I'm going to talk more about, oh, say, oh right, and the other thing is aside from that virtual model of the real world, there, you also have to have a virtual model of, uh, of not just the geometry, but also the rules that apply in the real world. So you have to have a model of the geometry and the procedures, or stated differently, both the data and the algorithms. And that is what I mean, that's part of what I mean by environment understanding, is acquiring that, first the geometry, and also expressing the rules that you apply to that geometry. So uh, I want to frame this concept of environment understanding within this existing paradigm. So before I mentioned human-computer interaction, I want to describe that in, a, in this kind of simplistic framework. So 
This diagram shows the simplistic framework where real characters on the right represent humans, including users, and the virtual nodes on the left represent computers. And the arrows here represent modes of interaction. And so I want to do something like I did before, where I want to add one more node, which is the real environment. And then notice what happens when I draw all the links, is that I get twice as many. So in other words, with just computers and humans, you had a certain number of modes of interaction. When I add the real environment, I double the number of possible interactions. So again, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I want to talk about you know, when, I, when I talk tonight about what, what I mean by a new way of thinking or a different way of thinking of augmented reality. It's not just about rendering holograms. It's also about this new way of interacting with computers. So I'm going to show some examples of what I mean. So earlier I mentioned that Cartman was including the real world. And I said that it, I couldn't show it in that picture, but I'll show it later, that the real world also has to include the hologram. And so here's an example of this. It's kind of a subtle example, so I'll show a more clear example in a moment. But notice here that you have this virtual teapot in this real hand. And just like before, the handle of the teapot is including the user's fingers. But also, the user's thumb is including that bottom part of the handle. In this picture, it doesn't seem that impressive. And in fact, we're so familiar with it. It seems pedestrian. What's the big deal? Well, it's actually kind of amazing. Because in order to pull this off, you have to have this representation of the real world in the computer, and it has to be very responsive. And that's, that's pretty cool. So this video shows another example that I think makes it a little bit more clear. So here a user is standing in front of the hologram and including it. Now he's behind the hologram. The hologram includes him. And we go around and around. And then he'll go around the back of the hologram. And both of those nodes will occur simultaneously. So he's being occluded by the hologram. And he's also occluding the hologram with his hand. So that's awesome. And this is one mode of interaction that is purely visual. And it's bi-directional. And that's really cool, but it gets even better. The interactions can go beyond just rendering and visual. They can also be physical. In this simulation, the virtual elements, which are these yellow balls, are interacting pseudo-physically with the real world, which is the table and the floor and so on. This is amazing. So let me show you some more of this video. Uh, this is a video from another colleague of mine, Sharam Azadi. We work together on HoloLens. And um, so in this case, the AR platform requires not only a geometric model of the real world, which is already amazing, but it also has to have a procedural model of how to simulate the physics. Lots of games have physics engines and can already pr uh, provide these, these physical interactions between virtual objects. A virtual object interacts with another virtual object. Here, virtual objects are interacting with real objects. That's very, very cool, and it gets even better. Virtual objects can also respond to changes in the real environment by real people. So this is the complementary modality of what I just showed you. In this example, uh, virtual objects which are mobile are responding to real objects which are also mobile. In the previous video, the real objects were stationary. In this example, they're mobile. So let's, let's look at this. So the, the balls there are virtual and the hands were real. And so the user is picking up these balls and manipulating them. This is another uh, uh, bit of research by my colleague Shimon and his, and his colleagues. Uh, there's another thing that augmented reality can do with the environment, which is to let you visualize things that were otherwise invisible. Wait, what? OK, so here's an example where we're using augmented reality platforms, which can sense things like Wi-Fi radio signals, and then let us see them by adding a rendering on top of the real environment. So that's pretty cool, too. And it gets even better. But before I explain what gets better, I want to take a detour to talk about how this thing in un uh, environment understanding works. Because understanding how this works explains what comes next and why it will happen. And this is where I take a little bit of a left turn, and I'm about to blow your socks off. So uh, I grab them because they're going to be up there. 
Marks on a pile of. <laughs> so augmented reality is a combination of three parts. One is the algorithms that let AR platforms understand the environment, such as tracking the pose of a headset. Another part is the output of those algorithms, which is, for example, a stream of rendered images. And the third part, which I'm leaving last because it's the sort of uh, it's the sort of climactic thing, which is the inputs. And this is when I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I wanted to talk about a new way of thinking about augmented reality. We're used to thinking about the outputs. But the inputs are what's really enabling for some really cool stuff that augmented reality platforms will eventually be able to do that probably not very many people are thinking about right now. So the thing is that augmented reality platforms, in order to pull off that seemingly simple but powerful illusion of world locking holograms, has to have this amazing array of sensors. It's not coming up awesome on this slide, but uh, that that thing on the left is, a, is an exploded view of an augmented reality platform called the Daiquiri. And it has crazy amounts of sensors on it. So here's another shot of it. And I'm going to zoom in on it. And again, it's a little bit blurry on, on this image. But what I'm zooming in on are a cluster of cameras. And in this case, one of the cameras, the one at the top, is a depth camera. And a depth camera, so this is, this is kind of cool, but I think people get so used to new technology no matter how mind-boggling it is, they're just, they're like, oh, I heard about that yesterday, that's normal now. But there's a new kind of camera, new in the sense that it's been around for about half a decade, and it's able to sense depth. And this is what it sees. What this is a picture of is depth. The dark regions are closer to you, and the brighter regions are farther from you. And in this picture, you can already make out certain things. You can see a person there on the right, and you can see a chair in the middle and then another, maybe couch, something on the left. It's hard to see what's going on above the couch, though. We can't see it from this picture, but I want to show you what you can do with these depth maps. You can fuse them together. You can take multiple depth maps in their poses and you can fuse them together to make a model of a room or of a scene. And so in this picture, it's starting to become a little bit more obvious what's going on. That blobby thing above the couch now is starting to look a little bit like a bookshelf. In fact, it's an Atari collection. Um, and you know, you can see some other elements. And the thing is, this isn't just a recoloring of that, pre of that previous image. Uh, it's just one perspective, but we can take other perspectives. So if we pull out and zoom, uh, tilt up and zoom out a little bit, this is another perspective of the same scene. So you can see the person, the chair, the couch, and the bookshelf. And we can zoom out even further and see that in the context of a living space and zoom out even further and you can start to see the whole living space. Okay. This is part of the magic be behind the interaction between real and virtual worlds. This is the geometry part that I mentioned. And this is the thing that lets AR platforms have real and virtual objects both occlude and collide with each other. That's pretty cool. And it gets even better. Starting with this geometric model of the real world, what else could an AR platform do? Well, let me show you, that, that was a couple of images, let me show you a video that I hope explains this better. So this is Shram again, he's picked up a Kinect which has a depth sensor, and he's going to walk around this room. And the upper left is the depth image, the instantaneous one, and the bottom two images are the fusion of all those depth images together to build a geometric model. So I'm going to play that again just to let it kind of sink in. Upper left is the depth map. Lower two images are the model that's cre being created. So as he walks around the room, a bunch of depth maps, and then notice that there's this geometric model that's getting sort of painted in as he looks around with the camera. That is called surface reconstruction. And that's one of the teams that I lead at Microsoft. So again, pretty cool. And this is what enables us to do the occlusion and uh, collision. What else does it let us do? Well, it can also help the computer understand the environment in more sophisticated ways. For example, it can help a user navigate a space. It can also help a, a virtual character navigate that same space. So if the computer has a uh, a geometric model of the space, and it understands the idea of connectivity or passability, you know, like what can you navigate or navigability. It can make up rules about, well, a person or a virtual character, which to a computer, what's the difference? 
uh, they can say, okay, a virtual character can go down down off the stage and you know uh, through that doorway or up the up the uh, up the steps here. Wouldn't be able to go through the wall. Wouldn't comfortably be able to climb the chairs. Right? So, what could you do with that? Well, what's the difference between an autonomous vehicle and a virtual vehicle? If I can get a virtual vehicle to navigate a space and I can make a really accurate physics simulation for that virtual vehicle, and by really accurate I mean it's obeying physical laws as we understand them, and I'm going to apply control signals to that virtual vehicle, like thrusters or other control surfaces, then the difference between that virtual vehicle and a real autonomous vehicle is very slight. I can apply, I can apply the same control signals to an actual vehicle, and it can, it can go and navigate the real world. So, uh, in fact, that's not really different from what autonomous vehicles actually do. Is an autonomous vehicle has a model of itself, and it's applying a virtual simulation to that model of itself and then it's taking the signals that it's applying to that virtual vehicle and applying it to its own actuators. And it flies around. So let me, uh, again, make this a little bit more concrete. So I used to explore caves, and that's a very dangerous and uncomfortable sport. And I used to actually not just explore them, I would survey them, and I did this for the, the US Geological Survey. And uh, I'll not bore you with the details of how you did it, or how one did it, but I would always be in the muck, in the dark, in the cold, with these precise instruments and taking these measurements, looking through these special kind of telescopes and so on, and thinking to myself, man, it would be great if you could just walk around and look at this and take a bunch of pictures and it would make the map for you. And then this movie came out, maybe some of you have seen it, it was called Prometheus, it was the prequel to the Alien movies. And here's a, a segment from that. So at one point they go into this vast cavern system and this guy tosses these drones into the air and they go flying around and they build this map of that cavern. Did anybody see that maybe? See this? Yeah. Okay. So I, I thought, oh cool, Ridley Scott had the same idea I did. He made a movie out of it. But we'll never do this. And then I started working on HoloLens. And uh, it turns out, so check this out. So this is a drone. It has a depth camera on it and a few other cameras. And then the upper right is the drone flying around, being chased by a grad student. And then the upper left is one of the cameras that's on the drone. And in the middle is the environmental model that it, it is creating, using essentially the same technique that Sharam was using with the Kinect, except that Sharam is holding it and waving it around. And in this case, the drone is flying around. And the drone both has to do this because it needs to know what not to fly into. But as a side effect, we get a model of this environment. And this could be pretty useful in a lot of situations. Okay. So uh, these autonomous quadrators could be sent to dangerous places and map them out and then remotely send us back this, uh, this signal. Right? So that's pretty cool and it gets way better. What else could AR platforms do when they understand the environment? So uh, before going any further, I want to recap here and talk about these. So I originally talked about these basic modes of augmented reality, such as occlusion and rendering and wall blocking. And then I talked about how augmented reality incorporates the environment in a few ways, such as occlusion, collision, manipulation, visualization, reconstruction, and navigation. The top three I would call sort of intermediate modes, and the bottom three are starting to get into uh, modalities that help us understand the world ourselves better. In the first case, we could start to see, we, it was like augmenting our senses, we could start to see radio waves. And in the last two, it helped us see the world that we live in from a different perspective, which is always very helpful. But what else can augmented reality platforms do for us? And where is it headed? Well, imagine that after we have this geometric model, we can formulate another kind of model. So here's an example where there's an augmented reality app that is showing a user how to repair some part of an engine. 
So the augmented reality platforms uh, platform knows where the various engine parts are, so it knows where to direct the user's attention. And then it can give instructions that are appropriate to the context to the user. That's pretty cool, but it presumes that the that the, the computer not only has a geometric model, but it also has another kind of model. And I'll give it a name in a second. But the point is, if it has that other kind of model, then it can help us understand the environment in a way that the computer does. So now the computer has some sort of understanding that we lack. I don't know how to, what, I don't even know what he's doing. I don't know how to repair that thing. It looks like a fan, maybe, some kind of turbine. And the computer understands it, and it's going to enhance my own cognition because the computer has precognized this for me. That's pretty cool. So, but we need more than just this geometric model. We need a semantic model. The augmented reality platform would need to be able to segment these pieces of geometry from the world and then label them with their names. Before I talked about, you know, I showed you these models of the real world, we saw chairs and people and couches and bookshelves, but the computer at that stage just saw a triangle, 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 little pieces of geometry. But we can take it a step further and semantically model this. And how did we learn to segment the world up into little pieces? Generally, by somebody, usually our parents initially, pointing at or touching something and saying its name, right? So can we do that with a computer? Look at this video. Oops. So here, a user is going to put his foot on the floor, and he's going to say the word floor. And then the computer is going to infer that the floor isn't just that one arc, it's everything that touches it. Then it goes and touches the chair and says the word chair. Notice it's a different color, so it's segmented from the world. Now he says table, and he's going to circle the banana and say banana. Now he's going to label the cup. And then when he pulls back, the other chairs are also going to be recognized as chairs. So what's going on here? There's a lot going on here, right? That's amazing. Uh, and this is not fate. This is something that we can actually do today. In fact, the same researcher whose name I've said over and over, Sharam and his team, have done this. So they've combined this geometric model, and now they've added to that a semantic model. And uh, at this point, again, we're probably already bored with the idea that computers can understand our speech. That's pretty amazing, too. I'm not going to talk about that today. But really, all they did in this, all that they did, I don't mean uh, all that the, the user in the video did was say things like table or lectern or chair or whatever, and the computer started to infer this. The video goes on and on, you know, and so it can generalize uh, to more than just that one shape of chair. It has a sort of dictionary of chairs and all that. But the point is that the AR platform can learn this stuff just by doing what we did as children, which is to look and to listen. Now, of course, there's an awesome algorithm behind all this. But the thing is that allowed this to happen, one of the key ingredients was all these inputs, this amazing set of inputs that are part of an augmented reality platform. Uh, there are already apps out there where, say, there's a real sign in the background and in the foreground is an augmented reality app that, that translates that sign in situ. So you could imagine if that phone, or instead of being a phone, was a headset, what the user wearing the headset would see was a sign in their own language. Right? So this is another example of a semantic model of the real world. But this is different. Before I was talking about geometry, and geometry is very concrete. In this case, the shapes here are abstract. There is no inherent meaning to a letter other than what we ascribe to it. The thing is, so this is symbolic semantic labeling before it was geometric semantic labeling. It turns out this is a little bit more in the comfort zone of a computer. This is uh, symbolic manipulation, and computers are actually better at dealing with symbolic uh, symbols than they are with other things. Um, it turns out, so people are also good at manipulating symbols, so that's something we have in common. Right? Computers and humans can both manipulate symbols relatively well. What is the most evolved form of symbolic 